song. It is He Leadeth Me. Yeah. 
dismissed right now. Good morning, Maxwell Baptist Church. I'm Joseph Gainier. Usually I have a Love Life t-shirt on, but it's really cold outside, so not today. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I want to read some scripture. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. There's a lot of beautiful truths in this scripture. Amen. So God has designed intricately each one of us in this room. There is no accidents. Everything has been designed by God. Everything has a purpose. So we can't look down on anybody else based on physical appearance, based on background, because God has given them value. We don't give ourselves value. God gives us value. And also, it says that each of our days was written in a book before they even came to pass. So that means from day one to the final day of your life, your life has value. And I want to focus real quick on a abortion here. Um, I want to read a quote. As the church, we must not say of abortion, this is murder, without saying to a pregnant woman, we will serve you. If we're doing the former without the latter, we aren't truly understanding the gospel. Let me say that one more time. As the church, we must not say of abortion, this is murder, without saying to a pregnant mom, we will serve you. If we're doing the former without the latter, we aren't truly understanding the gospel. So if I think about this, if Jesus stayed in heaven and continued to just call us murderers, adulterers, blasphemers, liars, stealers, and he did not come down, we'd still be all going to hell. But he chose to love each and one of us while we were sinners. He came down to die for our sins. So we are to mimic Christ's behavior. We are to, yes, speak the truth. Abortion is murder. But we also need to be there to help serve the moms who are going through this. So if you are a pregnant mom or you've had an abortion in your past, there are people, I know there are people in this church who are willing to serve you. We will listen to you. We will love you regardless of your past. We will foster and adopt your child if needed. We will provide financially for you. We will babysit. We will donate you to supplies. We will help mentor you, show you the love of Christ, the healing and the power of Christ. And we will support you in whatever ways that God has equipped us to do so. So I make the commitment right now, and I just want, if anyone else wants to make this commitment, please stand. Awesome. Praise the Lord. There's a concept called, that Love Life has created called the, a refuge church, a house of refuge. So we want moms to not go to the abortion clinic they, when they're in this situation. We want them to come to us, to the church, for us to show them love and compassion. So, yeah, I, I totally expected this. Praise God. So you, got, you can all be seated. Thank you so much for making that commitment. And then just to close, keep remembering to, to pray and to fast, because through your prayers, I believe that abortion is going to end in our state and in our city. So thank you.
Thank you, Joseph. Church, as you know, uh, we're actively involved in uh, Love Life. We're actively involved in the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in Union County. And we do believe that we can make a difference. There's a lot of talk, right? There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of political stuff that goes on, people out marching, doing things about uh, the sanctity of life, whether for or against abortion. But you know what? Love comes from our actions, not our words. I can stand out, say things all I want to, but until I move into action and put those words into action, that's when a dark and dying world starts to see the love of Christ. So, you know what? Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. As Christians, we deal with these hot topics on a daily basis, don't we? There's a lot of hot topics out there among us. And really, the sad thing about it is we don't want to get involved into this conversation because... Many of us fear that we might not have the answers to the questions on these topics. I struggled over the last couple of days on how I was going to bring this message. Usually on Sanctity of Life uh, topics, I'll come in, I'll, I'll give you the arguments of the, uh, the, the opposing side, and then I come in and, and, and talk about... Uh, what, you know, God's Word says, uh, you know, being that defense lawyer, that apologetic lawyer uh, that, that I have uh, been trained to do. But this morning I'm going after it in a little bit different way. And in that different way, I want to I talk to us today about how we can prepare to answer those questions, what the process may be in that, and then what the product of that will be. And we're going to be in Colossians 4, 2 through 6. 4, 2 through 6. And here's what I want us to think about. You know what? We have many opportunities that should drive us into conversations about these hot topics. We should be able to talk to people about these misconceptions and about these false claims concerning not only abortion, but how about the euthanasia process? How about when you get older and you have this uh, choice uh, or you think you have this choice to end your life? You know what? There's sanctity of life in our seniors. There's sanctity of life in a lot of different areas. Human trafficking. There's sanctity of life there. So, you know what? We should be able to sit down and talk to people about these things. We shouldn't be afraid to sit down and talk. Well, you know what, Chris? I just, my mind just don't work in that way. Well, challenge your mind. You know, as we get older, as I get older, uh, things don't come to me as quickly. Amen? <laughs> I mean, you know, but at the same time, if we think through these things, if we take our idle time and we start researching a lot of different areas or, or a topic that, that interests us out here, then what we can do is we can be prepared to talk about these things. And in doing that, you see, here's what we need to understand. In doing that, then it may provide us an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. That's the whole key, is to share the gospel of Christ in these issues. There's a method and strategy to deal with the issues of the sanctity of life, as well as just looking for that opportunity to, to, to tell the good news to someone. You know what? A lot of folks just don't want to share the good news with Christ. Why? Because it's offensive. Oh, they, they might think less of me. Oh, I might get fired from my job. Oh, I can't talk about that. But that's further from the truth. We should look for those opportunities. Reaching people for Jesus has become increasingly difficult over the past three decades. Used to, it was a thing that you could go anywhere. People would talk about the Bible, talk about the doctrines, talk about Christ, talk about these subjects. But over the last 30 years... Uh, even in my lifetime, you know, now there's threats of lawsuits. Now there's threats of all kinds, even against lives or 
you know, threatening to shut the church's doors down because of what we stand for. The name of Jesus offends where in the past it was lifted up and exalted in the church. Christians, as um, a prominent Bible teacher uh, would say, have stammered, stuttered, and clammed up on these issues. At the other extreme, some desire winning all the arguments at all costs. You know what? It's not about the person. It's about winning the arguments in this. You know, the, people get a thrill out of saying, hey, you know what? I best, I bested them or I'm one up them or, you know, they have it. And that's not what we're supposed to do. You see, we're not supposed to tear down the people, right? We're, st we're supposed to build the people up and then what? Proclaim Christ. That's what, what, that's what it's all about. You know, we're not supposed to demolish them or try and win the argument because then it goes against what 1 Peter 3.15 says. It says, set apart Christ in our hearts, what? To be ready to give an answer to those who ask us in reverence and gentleness. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be ready to do that. I like it. <laughs> no more of a blessing on Sanctity of Life Sunday to hear of a, a child who like that. Throughout a marketplace of 28 years that I was in, being a pastor for the last 12 years, I've learned by experience how to engage those who are seriously looking for the truth. And I've learned who those folks are that are looking for a hostile conversation. When we go into opportunities of talking to people about the sanctity of life, we must keep at the forefront what God's desire is over this, okay? A lot of times we forget that God's desire for the person that we're talking to about the subject we're talking to is what? To bring them to an understanding of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. God's greatest desire for all people is this. He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of him, 1 Timothy 2.4. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, Titus 2.11. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but his patience toward you, not wishing any to perish, but all to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. Puts a different twist on our conversations with these folks. Where the world and the politics end is a us versus them, yelling, screaming, you're either on this side or that side. Christ tells us that we should be the mediators and we should come in and we should have those conversations with the forethought of this precious soul who may need to come to Christ and have a change of heart and a change of mind. We need to understand God's heart and his desires when we have these conversations about these topics. When we understand it's not about winning the argument that is important, it's presenting the truth or the standard of, of, of the moral question that's important. You see, because sanctity of life is a moral issue. People will say it's not. But it is a moral issue. To present the gospel of Christ to them, we, we need to just to remember that and, and not forget that. So there is a strategy that we can use to help us be bold and confident in giving evidence and witness to others about these topics. And this is, this is what I struggled with over the last three days. But I really think that after even Joseph came up, that, that, well, I don't think, I know, because the Lord knows best, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what I think, but uh, that, that we're on the right track here. And I want to give you 
uh, uh, three truths here in a moment about that. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 2 through 6. If you have your phones, you can pull it up there. But this is what the Word of God said. It says, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Now, a lot of times when I teach this or, or I'm in front of a group, I'll say, uh, Supervisors, employees, CEOs, employees. See, that, that, that puts it into today's terms, right? Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So what does that word devote mean? It means to commit. It means to give over. You know what? We, we should be in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving to God as we go through our daily lives. If we're overseeing people, if we're working for people, whatever it may be, you see, we're out in the marketplace, right? Right? We're out into the community. We have friends and family that we uh, know of and are around that we can sit down and, and talk about this topic we're talking about with. And, and Paul says, hey, you know what? Just remember as you're going through these conversations, you have a master in heaven, and that's Jesus Christ, and that's where our focus should be in this. Not on what? Winning that argument. That's important. I, 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 how, do, how did I learn that? Well, you see, I was on the other side of it. I wanted to win the argument. I wanted to force it. I wanted people to come to Christ, and I wanted them to see this, this uh, viewpoint. And I learned that you couldn't do that. So he says, devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it, with an attitude of thanksgiving. We know that Paul says you should pray without ceasing, uh, that you should give the Lord thanksgiving in all that you do. And then he goes on in verse 3, and he says, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us, adore the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak, Conduct yourselves with wisdom uh, towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each other. So watch what? Paul's writing the Colossian church. This letter was written between 60 and 62 A.D. while he was in prison. Did you see that? He said, I'm in prison. This is what I'm in prison for is because I stood and I stand upon Christ and the foundation and the word. And it was written because of the false teachings that had infiltrated the church about Jesus. If you go back, you look in uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, 7, and 8 there, you'll see that there were false philosophies. There were traditions of men that were being taught over the deity of Christ. Well, you know what? When we come down and we think about the, 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 the topics that we have today, what are these topics about? It's all about who? It's all about um, lies over the truth of what abortion is or what euthanasia is or whatever it may. There's false philosophies out there. As we sit down and we talk about these topics, so Paul was defending the deity of Christ and he was asking the church to stand strong against these false teachings. So in these verses, what we have is a strategy to have conversation with others about these various topics and how to be ready to give the answers to the questions that are asked. Three truths I want to talk about real quickly. Preparations of answering the question process of answering the question and the product of answering the question. So let's look at this first truth. In answering questions, we need to understand there's a preparation time, right? No matter what we do, 
If we're in our jobs, if we're planning a vacation, whatever it is, there's preparation, right? We prepare to do things. Well, you know what, church? We should prepare to see ourselves in these conversations with other people, and we need to prepare uh, to do that. So what's the first step in preparation? It's prayer. Prayer is an important concept in anything that we do. The battle for men's souls is won in the spiritual realm. What did Paul say? He said, devote yourselves to prayer, praying at the same time. You see, we're in, the, we're in a battle for men's souls. We're going before the, the throne of God in prayer, and, and we're trying to be in tune with God's heart, not ours. This is important. Because a lot of times we have this preconceived ideas and, and we bring them to the conversation, but we're not looking at it through God's eyes. And when we, through, when we look at it through God's eyes, then we start looking at the other person the way that God does. I made them in my image. I love them just as much as I love you. There's a barrier there that we need to get through. I want to use you, Chris, to help break down that barrier. You see, that's a whole different attitude because I've went through prayer. I went to the throne of God than just going at it on my own, thinking that because I have all the information that I can win the argument. Here's where the understanding of barriers of the intellect and the emotions and the, the volitional attitudes will be exposed. You see, when you go to prayer and when you ask God about these things and, 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 and you prepare yourself to be able to get into that conversation, the Holy Spirit will allow you to say, no, this is an intellectual barrier. They need to know the facts. They need to know the truth. They need to look at the whole argument. Or if it's an emotional barrier, what's well, an emotional barrier? No, you know what? I've already been in a church that told me that they would be there for me, and they never did. The pastor hurt me. The deacons hurt me. The elders hurt me. Uh, somebody hurt me in church, and so what does that do? It throws up an emotional barrier. Or there's just those who says, I don't care what you say, Chris. I'm not going to believe it. That's a volitional barrier. So when we go to prayer, we can, we can spot these things in these conversations that we're supposed to have. Paul speaks to the Ephesians about uh, the struggle. And the struggle's not, what, against flesh and blood. It's not against me and the person across from me. We make it that way, don't we? He says that, it's against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6.12. So you know what? It's a spiritual battle. There's an enemy, an adversary who prowls around looking for people to devour. Guess what? When you have that in your mind frame as you're talking to people, you can sit there and you can say, hey, wait just a second. You know what? It's not me that they... That's the spiritual attack behind their arguments towards me. That's 1 Peter 5, 8. Who veils the gospel? Who's, who does that? Satan does. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. To keep them in the dark and not hearing the truth. Not only does the enemy veil the truth, but he wants to kill, steal, and destroy anything that God has planned. Did you know that? And the big thing, even about these hot topics, especially with abortion, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy the Christian's view of this because he hates the family. That's why it's important to, to understand and to be prepared about sitting there talking to whoever it may be. You see, Jesus even says that, John 10.10. 10, he said, the, the, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But can I tell you this? In all the armor metaphor that Paul uses in Ephesians 6, prayer is the most, it, prayer is the one that is used least. A lot of times we want to put on all the other armor, but we don't 
use that last piece, which is prayer. It's the most neglected piece of armor when we go out to have these conversations about Jesus and about the moral topics or whatever it may be. We haven't prayed through them. The enemy wants to keep this important weapon out of our hands. If it's unused and rusty, then what? The dynamite behind that prayer. Who's the dynamite behind the prayer? The Holy Spirit is the dynamite. He's the one that resides in us, right? So if we're not in tune with God, then how can the Holy Spirit use us to be able to enlighten folks as, as we talk to them? And, and, and he, he, he's working on our hearts and their hearts, uh, the Holy Spirit. Then if there's something in our hearts, it can be greatly hindered. Our conversation can be greatly hindered. And then Paul says in verse 3, he says, pray for open doors. He says, pray for open doors. It's through prayer which we can ask God to open doors for the opportunities to lead into sharing the gospel. Have you done that? Do you pray every morning that God will lead you or open a door for you to tell someone else about the gospel? I can promise you that if you do that, he will open that door for you. A lot of times we don't want to pray that prayer. Why? Because we don't want to get into that conversation. We need to ask him to allow us to sense those doors that, that we can go through and those that we can't. That's the Holy Spirit in us. We, when we ask God to open doors and, and to give us a sense of when we can talk with people. You ever struggled with that? I really want to share the gospel with people, but I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to get into the conversation. Well, if you listen, there's key words. Abortion, open door. Marriage, open door. I'm hopeless, open door. You see, you can get into conversations if you pick up on the key words. If, if you've prayed through this and asked the Holy Spirit to allow you to be sensitive, you can see the doors open in those conversations. You don't have to force it. You don't have to go in there and come up to somebody and say, hey, let's talk about this. You don't have to do that. Just let the Holy Spirit lead you in that. Allow him to open that conversation up. But it is through topics such as abortion that, that those conversations can be opened up. And those conversations don't have to be um, argumentative. It's like talking to your best friend. If you go into it talking like you, you're, you're talking to your best friend, even though they get heated, Maybe the other one might get heated. You can say, hey, wait just a second. We're just having an open and honest conversation about this. There's nothing to be heated about. We, we don't have to talk about it, right? You can even say, we don't. Let's, let's just forget about it if you're going to get, you know, so upset about it. Because they're not going to listen to you anyway. <laughs> Put yourself in their spot. You've done the same thing with your parents. Or with a friend or your husband or your wife. You get to that point, you say, uh, I'm through. I'm not going to talk to anybody. Yeah. It's the same thing when we witness. And then Paul says to speak clearly in verse 4. We ought to pray that, 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 that we can clearly speak. You know, he says that I may make it clear in the way I speak or I ought to speak. Sometimes I don't speak clearly. How about you? People don't know or they might misunderstand what we're talking about or, or what we're trying to get across. You see, when we talk about these sanctity of life issues, we, we must make our points clear through our conversation. How do we do that? Well, we have to research the topic. You see, here's where we don't like to do it, right? We don't like to research anything like that a lot of times. Well, you can go talk to the pastor. You can go talk to the Sunday school teacher. You know, no, I, that's not my job as a Christian to talk to people about this. Yes, it is. 
It's all of our jobs. God didn't just say, hey, it's the preacher's job or the evangelist's job or whoever it was. It's every one of us' job to be able to sit down and talk. So you know what? Before you get into a, a, a conversation about abortion or, or, or marriage or uh, you know, homosexuality or transgendering and, and all of this, research the topics. See what the opposing side's argument is and then go back in and see what God's argument is and, and show them how God uses science and uses history and uses archaeology and things like that to say, look, here's the evidence of it. Right here. Here's what your argument is. Here's what God's argument is. Here, here, here's the, 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 the logical part of it. Let me just give you an example on this. Y'all know what sonograms are, um, you know, MRI, whatever it is. Right? We all know what that is. Why do you think that Joseph and Shay fight so hard up at uh, La Trobe to get these ladies into the um, bus to get those. Because they know that when they put that on their belly and they see that life within them, they automatically see that, you know what, everything they've been told is a lie. So you know what? You have to research. You have to get your um, argument straight, per se, and your logic straight to, to be able to sit down with them and, and pray through that so that you can speak clearly to them about whatever you're talking about. We ask for the Holy Spirit's help to guide us and give us confidence and boldness to present our case and evidence clearly. Secondly, in answering questions, we need to understand the process. The process. Five and six. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be um, with grace as though seasoned with salt so that we'll know how you should respond or we should know how we can respond to each person. So the process is our conduct have you ever talked to somebody who was talking this real big thing or that they were, they were saying that they were good and all this and their conduct five minutes later showed otherwise? It, it's a lot of complaint that you get from even non-Christians. But Christians complain about it too. A lot of times conduct tells the world how we live you see, our life should reflect the love and respect and humility and kindness that Christ shows. That's who our example is, right? So it should reflect in our lives as we talk to people about these sensitive topics. It's very important. I've sat across from people um, who's, you know, told me, hey, you know, why should I believe this? Other people say this, and you know what? They're living just like the world. Why should I believe that? If their conduct's like that, then what credible witness is that? To be a credible witness and have opportunities to talk with people, we got to reflect the love of Christ. And we can't get into the heated discussions, but we need to get into great discussions. It's great discussions, great conversations. And then what happens? Then we have opportunities, right? When we do that, then we don't have to worry about them to bring that up. But in, in the last part of, Verse 5, he says, making the most of the opportunity. So, so how do we make the most of the opportunity? We've prayed for the open doors. We've recognized them. We've researched and prayed through everything. And now we have the opportunity uh, through the Holy Spirit leading us to get into these conversations. That's the opportunities that we miss every day, right? 
We walk away from them a lot of times. I don't have time. You know what? I'm busy. Or we're thinking about something and we miss those windows of opportunity. And then Paul says speech. Let your speech always be with grace. It's tied, uh, this is tied with speaking clearly. We should speak in grace and love, never offensive, never arguing, but in calmness and gentleness. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 3 and 5, in reverence. We have to look at people because why? They were made in God's image, just like us. That's a key point. In, in, in my experience of talking to people about issues like this, if you sit across from someone and you've already judged them, then what's happened? You bring a, what, pointed perspective into the conversation. Did you know that within the first 30 seconds that you meet someone new, they've already sized you up and judged you? So we have to, what, bring that speed. We've got to have that conduct as we walk into the opportunities, the speech where, where, where it's love and grace. Why is it? Because Paul says what? He says, let your speech always be with grace as seasoned with salt. What does salt do? do? It flavors our food, right? Not only that, but it preserves uh, uh, decay. And that's what Christians are supposed to do. We're supposed to what? Help preserve a decaying culture. But not only that, but have you ever had salt in a cut? It burns, right? So you know what? As we go through this argument and as we show the love of Christ and our conduct shows it and our speech shows it, then it does burn into those who don't believe because it's a factor, a healing factor, a burning factor uh, in talking to them about Jesus Christ. It attracts people. And then we have that response. He says, uh, so that we know how we should respond to each person. Well, how should we respond? Well, first of all, we have to be ready in season and out of season, right? Even if we're not looking for it, we have to be ready. We should be ready to contend for the faith, actually, Jude says. Contend for it, fight for it, engage for it, but respectfully in the doctrines of the, uh, of the word. We need to be sensitive because we don't know the situation a person may be, or may be in or have come from. See, a lot of times we get in our head that we're wanting to win this argument. We forget about where the other person is. If you're talking about abortion with someone, that person may have been involved in one. Which one would they would rather hear? Someone who's trying to win the argument or someone who comes to them lovingly? working through it with them like a counselor does. Aren't we supposed to be ambassadors for Christ? It's a whole different ball game than what the culture presents, that what TV presents or the news presents. That's hostile. And we all know that we don't like to be backed in a corner and we don't like to be talked down to and we don't like to be, uh, you know, harshly treated. So why would these folks? Why would these folks who, 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 who don't have a worldview like ours want to listen to us? Well, they might if we treat them the way that Paul is talking about here in chapter 4. Thirdly, in answering questions... We need to understand the product. So, you know what? We need to understand the product. Where do we find the product at? How do we, how do, we do this? How, what's our responsibility in this? 
Well, if you'll turn with me to John 16, let me take you through this real quickly. Here's the product. It's the result. You see, we need to trust God with the results, not ourselves, right? We need to trust God with the results. It's the Holy Spirit who opens the mind and convicts the truth. Look in, in John chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. This is Jesus talking to the, to the disciples. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask me where I'm going. But because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will what? What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts who? Okay. Concerning what? Sin and what? And? Concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning the judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Guess what, y'all? When we get into... Oh, sorry, that, that was a southern turn, wasn't it, y'all? <laughs> I'm from southern Ohio. I can say that, right? <laughs> but when we, do, when we get into these conversations, it's not up to us for the results. It's the Holy Spirit's job. We've done our job. We are to be obedient in presenting the truth and then allowing the Holy Spirit to do his work. Have we failed if, if people do not agree with the, the truth that we, we present to them? Have we failed? Absolutely not because success is defined by obedience. And the, the obedience end of it is sitting down and having these conversations with these folks in love and talking to them and then allowing the work of the Holy Spirit to convict them. Even if we don't get to the gospel. No, Chris, you know what? I, I've, I've taught this before. No, no, wait, no, no, you've got to get to the gospel. No, we don't. That's not up to us. Maybe we just get to the, the two arguments of the abortion issue or the euthanasia issue or whatever it is, and that's as far as we get. Have we been successful? Yes, we have. Why? Because you and I are a, a number on God's number line. You may be the first person that's talked to them about it. You may be the seventh person that's talked about it to them about it. And then the 21st person comes along, and, and he's the one or she's the one that can share the gospel, and she has the privilege of watching God bring him into the kingdom. Not me, not you, God. So, so success is defined by obedience. No matter how far we get into the argument or the cause. We never fail if we present the truth through the word of God. We, we must just continue to trust that God will continue to impact their lives. John 12, 32 says what? He draws all men to him, right? Right? Well, how does he do that? Well, it's, it's, it's in the Word, right? Isaiah 118 says what? Come now, let us reason. How does God reason with us? What's it say in Isaiah 118? He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Well, what is reason? Reason is to draw a conclusion, right? That's what it is. God says, come and let us reason through all of this. Hey, go and reason as you, you talk about these things. So God draws men by reason. We all have got minds. We all know the facts or we know what's true, what's false. So he draws us through reason, but he draws us through his word. That's how he draws people to himself. How do I know that? 
Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I want you to go back to how you come to Christ. Somewhere, somehow in your life, you heard the gospel. Somewhere, somehow. God, through your reason and through the Holy Spirit's work, don't get me wrong. You know what? I understand being born again. I understand the Holy Spirit. I understand what his job is. But through reason, through truth, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's done, how he's done it, when he's come up, all of that, then we have to what? Make a response to it. Faith comes through hearing and the hearing by the word of God. So you know what? When we're setting across from those folks, we need to keep that in mind that God's working on them through their reason, through the facts, through the truth. And if we get to that point where we can turn that conversation to say, hey, you know what? Let's talk a little bit about Jesus and, and, and about his word. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because this is his word. He's the truth. Nobody, he's the truth. Doesn't matter what you think, what I think. Jesus is the truth, and Jesus values all life. So what's stopping you from believing in him today? I mean, there's, there's some other things that you can put in there. But you see, you can turn that conversation if you see that door opening to do that. So in answering questions pertaining to the sanctity of life issues, we need to understand there's preparation, there's process, and there's product. It's through these key truths we can be bold in confidence in our witness. We can help them understand. You know what? In all the stuff that people do, they're looking for one thing, whether they know it or not. Doesn't matter what it is. They're looking for the Lord. They're looking for God. That's what they're doing. They're trying to fill their life with something other than God. John W. Peterson was going through a tough time in life when he wrote this song. Have y'all ever went through a tough time in life? You know, I think this is a great song because when we're sitting across from others, we can relate to it because we've all gone through tough times. Think about somebody who's went through an abortion. Whether that's, whether that's the dad or the mom, doesn't matter. He said, no one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. He's waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly he whispers comfort and the broken heart heals. No one understands like Jesus when foes of life assail. There you go. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on your way. Though you fail him, sadly fail him. He will pardon you today. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near, so dear as Jesus cast your every care on him. There's forgiveness at the cross, folks. Christians, there's forgiveness at the cross in how we treat people on these topics. Because you know what? Sometimes we treat them pretty rough. And we need to ask forgiveness so that God can use us in these conversations. Jesus came and, and he shed his precious blood for the sins of this world. He overcame death and proclaimed victory. And that victory is ours, Christians. We need to put that in the forefront and remember why we're here and why we're in this. But, 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 but maybe you don't have that victory today. Maybe you're sitting here and saying, Chris, yeah, I've, I've been a part of that. Can I tell you, you can have victory today, even if you've been a part of that abortion issue or any type of sin that you've done, you can have victory today in Jesus Christ. 
that guilt-ridden feeling when you come to Christ and you, and, and you admit that and you admit that you need him in your life and everything, it'll be washed away. That's his promise. You'll be set free of that. Not only will you be set free of that, but he can allow you to use that to talk to other people about it. You know, if you've been a part of an abortion, you can be assured by coming and trusting in Jesus Christ that you'll see your child again in heaven. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's one of my favorite verses. That applies to non-Christians as well as Christians. I say that verse every night. 1 John 1, 9, Lord, I know somewhere, somehow I've let you down. And I thank you for this promise that if I confess my sin, you're faithful and, and righteous to forgive me of my sins and cleanse that from me. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. Thank you for your grace. See, all we have to do is simply admit our sin, believe in him, and confess what he's done for us. And then follow him. Have you done that this morning? Maybe you're here, you're not a Christian. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning? You don't have to come up and ask me to do that. or You can do it right where you're sitting. All you got to do is reach out and admit to him that you're a sinner, that you repent of those sins, that you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that he rose again for you, and thank him for that. Christian, something in your life maybe this morning that you need to confess maybe it is conversations maybe it is viewpoints maybe it is world view about what we've talked about we've heard this morning that Jesus gives us a strategy to be able to talk to people about things like that and how we should do it maybe you just need to come to him and ask him to strengthen you in doing that Maybe you need forgiveness for the way that you've treated people. He's right there. He's waiting. Uh, and, and, and he can strengthen you and give you the knowledge and the wisdom and the perseverance to be able to make a difference in his kingdom. As the praise team come, as Joseph and Laura come, uh, you just do whatever you need to do. If you need to talk to me, you come and talk to me. I'll be glad to pray with you. The altar's open. But you know what? You don't need me and you don't need a priest because you got a direct line to, to God to be able to talk to him about that. Let's stand, please. <laughs>
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your throne, and Father, we just come and we commit ourselves to the prayer of keeping alert and to have an attitude of thanksgiving this day. Father, we pray at the same time that, Lord, you'll open up a door for us, that, Father, you would just allow us to be able to walk through that door and share your word with somebody that you bring into our lives. Lord, no matter what the persecution or the oppression may be, Father, allow us to stand and to proclaim your truth. Lord, we just pray that as we do that, would you make it, allow us to make it clear in the way that we ought to speak? And Father, may our conduct be pleasing and may we have the wisdom that we need towards the outsiders who may uh, be wanting to come in, who, who watch us each and every day, and, and, and Lord, who watch our example. Father, let us make the most of the opportunity and forgive us where we've missed those open doors and opportunity. Lord, always let our speech be salted with grace. Allow our lives to be fa flavorful our speech to be the same way. Lord, so that we'll know how to respond to each person, that, that we won't have preconceived ideas, but, Lord, that we'll be seeing them through your eyes and your, your heart and what you see in them so that we can have the love and the compassion to be able to talk with them. Father, we come before your throne once again. And, Lord, we do lift up Jonathan and Carrie and Barbara and the family. Father, I just pray that you just bring comfort to them. That your Holy Spirit would envelop them and, and, and fill that hole, that void that they have in their lives. I just pray, Lord, for boldness and strength in the coming days as they have the celebration of life service and as they rejoice because they are assured and they know without a shadow of a doubt gems with you father there's many other things that are on our hearts burdens joys concerns that you know about and I pray for that this morning I ask Lord that you would just meet each one right where they're at just assure them let them know you're right there with them walking along with them that they would just trust you. Father, I thank you for each one that's here. And I thank you for bringing them this way this morning. I pray, Father, that as we leave this place today, that we'll look for open doors and opportunities to have conversations. And as we do that, Lord, find us obedience and give us the boldness and the strength to say what we need to. Lord, let us be the light in this dark world. And allow us, Lord, to make a difference and engage into the community and engage into the world so that, Lord, people would know who you are and that you have a purpose for them and that you love them. So, Father, as we leave this place, we just give you all the praise and the honor and the glory that you so richly deserve. For it's in the name that's above all names the name in which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. It's in the beautiful name, the powerful name of Jesus Christ we make this prayer. Amen.